was difficult. I wanted to be a good son and listen, but the two fathers did not say the same things. The contrast in their points of view, particularly where money was concerned, was so extreme that I grew curious and intrigued. I began to start thinking for long periods of time about what each was saying. Much of my private time was spent reflecting, asking myself questions such as, why does he say that? And then asking the same question of the other dad's statement. It would have been much easier to simply say, yeah, he's right, I agree with that, or to simply reject the point of view by saying, the old man doesn't know what he's talking about. Instead, having two dads whom I love force me to think and ultimately choose a way of thinking for myself. As a process, choosing to think for myself turned out to be much more valuable in the long run rather than simply accepting or rejecting a single point of view. One of the reasons the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, and the middle class struggles in debt is because the subject of money is taught at home, not in school. Most of us learn about money from our parents. So what can a poor parent tell their child about money? They simply say, stay in school and study hard. The child may graduate with excellent grades, but with a poor person's financial programming and mindset. It was learned while the child was young. Money is not taught in schools. Schools focus on scholastic and professional skills, but not financial skills. This explains how smart bankers, doctors, and accountants who are in excellent grades in school may still struggle financially all their lives. Our staggering national debt is due in large part to highly educated politicians and government officials making financial decisions with little or no training on the subject of money. I often look ahead to the new millennium and wonder what will happen when we have millions of people who will need financial and medical assistance. They will be dependent upon their families or the government for financial support. What will happen when Medicare and Social Security run out of money? How will a nation survive if teaching children about money continues to be left to parents, most of whom will be, or already are, poor? Because I had two influential fathers, I learned from both of them. I had to think about each dad's advice, and in doing so, I gained valuable insight into the power and effect of one's thoughts on one's life. For example, one dad had a habit of saying, I can't afford it. The other dad forbade those words to be used. He insisted I say, how can I afford it? One is a statement, and the other is a question. One lets you off the hook, and the other forces you to think. My soon-to-be-rich dad would explain that by automatically saying the words, I can't afford it, your brain stops working. By asking the question, how can I afford it, your brain is put to work. He did not mean buy everything you wanted. He was fanatical about exercising your mind the most powerful computer in the world. My brain gets stronger every day because I exercise it. The stronger it gets, the more money I can make. He believed that automatically saying, I can't afford it, was a sign of mental laziness. Although both dads worked hard, I noticed that one dad had a habit of putting his brain to sleep when it came to money matters, and the other had a habit of exercising his brain. The long-term result was that one dad grew stronger financially and the other grew weaker. It is not much different from a person who goes to the gym to exercise on a regular basis versus someone who sits on the couch watching television. Proper physical exercise increases your chances for health, and proper mental exercise increases your chances for wealth. Laziness decreases both health and wealth. My two dads had opposing attitudes and thought. One dad thought that the rich should pay more in taxes and take care of those less fortunate. The other said, taxes punish those who produce and reward those who don't produce. One dad recommended, study hard so you can find a good company to work for. The other recommended, study hard so you can find a good company to buy. One dad said, the reason I'm not rich is because I have you kids. The other said, the reason I must be rich is because I have you kids. One dad encouraged talking about money and business at the dinner table. The other forbade the subject of money to be discussed over a meal. One said, when it comes to money, play it safe and don't take risks. The other said, learn to manage risk. 
One believed, our home is our largest investment and our greatest asset. The other believed, my house is a liability, and if your house is your largest investment, you're in trouble. Both dads paid their bills on time. Yet one paid his bills first, while the other paid his bills last. Being a product of two strong dads allowed me the luxury of observing the effects different thoughts have on one's life. I noticed that people really do shape their life through their thoughts. For example, my poor dad always said, I'll never be rich. And that prophecy became reality. My rich dad, on the other hand, always referred to himself as rich. He would say things like, I'm a rich man, and rich people don't do this. Even when he was flat broke, after a major financial setback, he continued to refer to himself as a rich man. He would cover himself by saying, there is a difference between being poor and being broke. Broke is temporary and poor is eternal. My poor dad would also say, I'm not interested in money or money doesn't matter. My rich dad always said, money is power. The power of our thoughts may never be measured or appreciated, but it became obvious to me as a young boy to be aware of my thoughts and how I express myself. I noticed that my poor dad was poor not because of the amount of money. Because today Jimmy's mom drove up in their new Cadillac and they were going to their beach house for the weekend. He took three of his friends, but Mike and I weren't invited. They told us we weren't invited because we were poor kids. They did? My dad asked incredulously. Yeah, they did, I replied in a hurt tone. My dad silently shook his head, pushed his glasses up the bridge of his nose, and went back to reading his paper. I stood waiting for an answer. The year was 1956. I was nine years old. By some twist of fate, I attended the same public school where the rich people sent their kids. We were primarily a sugar plantation town. The managers of the plantation and the other affluent people of the town, such as doctors, business owners, and bankers, sent their children to this school, grades 1 to 6. After grade 6, their children were generally sent off to private schools. Because my family lived on one side of the street, I went to this school. Had I lived on the other side of the street, I would have gone to a different school with kids from families more like mine. After grade 6, these kids and I would go on to the public intermediate and high school. There was no private school for them or for me. My dad finally put down the paper. Well, son, he began slowly, if you want to be rich, you have to learn to make money. How do I make money, I asked. Well, use your head, son, he said, smiling. Which really meant, that's all I'm going to tell you, or, uh, I don't know the answer, so don't embarrass me. The next morning I told my best friend Mike what my dad had said. As best I could tell, Mike and I were the only poor kids in this school. Mike was like me in that he was in this school by a twist of fate. Someone had drawn a jog in a line for the school district, and we wound up in school with the rich kids. So what do we do to make money? Mike asked. I don't know, I said. But do you want to be my partner? He agreed. And so on that Saturday morning, Mike became my first business partner. We spent all morning coming up with ideas on how to make money. Finally, that afternoon, a bolt of lightning came through our heads. It was an idea that Mike had gotten from a science book he'd read. Excitedly, we shook hands, and the partnership now had a business. For the next several weeks, Mike and I ran around our neighborhood, knocking on doors and asking our neighbors if they'd save their toothpaste tubes for us. With puzzled looks, most adults consented with a smile. Some asked us what we were doing, to which we replied, We can't tell you. It's a business secret. My mom grew distressed as the weeks wore on. We had selected a site next to her washing machine as the place we would stockpile our raw materials. In a brown cardboard box that one time held ketchup bottles, our little pile of used toothpaste tubes began to grow. One day my dad drove up to see two nine-year-old boys in the driveway with a production line operating at full speed. Fine white powder everywhere. On a long table were small milk cartons from school, and our family's hibachi grill was glowing with red-hot coals at maximum heat. Dad walked up cautiously, having to park the car at the base of the driveway, 
since the production line blocked the carport. As he got closer, he saw a steel pot sitting on top of the coals, with the toothpaste tubes being melted down. In those days, toothpaste did not come in plastic tubes. The tubes were made of lead. So once the paint was burned off, the tubes were dropped in a small steel pot, melted until they became liquid. And with my mom's pot holders, we were pouring the lead through a small hole in the top of the milk cartons. The milk cartons were filled with plaster of Paris. The white powder everywhere was the plaster before we mixed it with water. The milk cartons were the outer containers for plaster of Paris molds. My dad watched as we carefully poured the molten lead through a small hole in the top of the plaster of Paris cube. What are you boys doing? He asked with a cautious smile. We're doing what you told me to do. We're going to be rich, I said. Yep, said Mike, grinning and nodding his head. We're partners. And what is in those plaster molds? Dad asked. Watch, I said. This should be a good match. With a small hammer, I tapped at the seal that divided the cube in half. Cautiously, I pulled up the top half of the plaster mold, and a lead nickel fell out. Oh my God! My dad said, "You're casting nickels out of lead." That's right, Mike said. We're making money. My dad smiled and shook his head. Along with a fire and a box of spent toothpaste tubes in front of him, were two little boys covered with white dust and smiling from ear to ear. He asked us to put everything down and sit with him on the front step of our house. With a smile, he gently explained what the word counterfeiting meant. Our dreams were dashed. You mean this is illegal? Asked Mike. Yes, it is illegal, my dad said gently. But you boys have shown great creativity and original thought. Keep going. I'm really proud of you. Disappointed, Mike and I sat in silence for about twenty minutes before we began cleaning up our mess. The business was over on opening day. Sweeping the powder up, I looked at Mike and said, "I guess Jimmy and his friends are right. We are poor." My father was just leaving as I said that. Boys, he said, "You're only poor if you give up. The most important thing is that you did something. Most people only talk and dream of getting rich. You've done something. I'm very proud of the two of you. I will say it again. Keep going. Don't quit." Mike and I stood there in silence. There were nice words, but we still did not know what to do. So how come you're not rich, Dad? I asked. Because I chose to be a school teacher. School teachers really don't think about being rich. We just like to teach. I wish I could help you, but I really don't know how to make money. Mike and I turned and continued our cleanup. I know," said my dad. If you boys want to learn how to be rich, don't ask me. Talk to your dad, Mike. My dad?" asked Mike with a scrunched-up face. "Yeah, your dad." Repeated my dad with a smile. "Your dad and I have the same banker, and he raves about your father. He's told me several times that your father is brilliant when it comes to making money. He seems to be building an empire, and I suspect in a few years he will be a very rich man." With that, Mike and I got excited again. With new vigor, we began cleaning up the mess caused by our now defunct first business. As we were cleaning, we made plans on how and when to talk to Mike's dad. The problem was that Mike's dad worked long hours, and often did not come home until late. His father owned warehouses, a construction company, a chain of stores, and three restaurants. It was the restaurants that kept him out late. Mike caught the bus home after we had finished cleaning up. He was going to talk to his dad when he got home that night, and ask him if he would teach us how to become rich. Mike promised to call as soon as he talked to his dad, even if it was late. The phone rang at 8:30 p.m. Mike's dad had agreed to meet with Mike and me. At 7:30 Saturday morning, I caught the bus to the poor side of town. Michael and I met with his dad that morning at 8 o'clock. He was already busy and had been at work for more than an hour. His construction supervisor was just leaving in his pickup truck as I walked up to his simple, small, and tidy home. Mike met me at the door. Dad's on the phone, and he said to wait on the back porch. Mike said as he opened the door. The old wooden floor creaked as I stepped across the threshold of this aging house. There was a cheap mat just inside the door. That mat was there to hide the years of wear from countless footsteps that the floor had supported. 
Although clean, it needed to be replaced. I felt claustrophobic as I entered the narrow living room, which was filled with old, musty, overstuffed furniture that today would be collector's items. Sitting on the couch were two women, a little older than my mom. Across from the women sat a man in workman's clothes. They smiled as Mike and I walked past them, heading for the kitchen, which led to the porch that overlooked the backyard. I smiled back shyly. Who are those people, I asked. Oh, they work for my dad. The older man runs his warehouses, and the women are the managers of the restaurants. And you saw the construction supervisor who's working on a road project about 50 miles from here. His other supervisor, who's building a track of houses, had already left before you got here. Does this go on all the time, I asked. Not always, but quite often, said Mike, smiling as he pulled up a chair to sit down next to me. I asked him if he teaches to make money, Mike said. Oh, and what did he say to that, I asked with cautious curiosity. Well, he had a funny look on his face at first, and then he said he would make us an offer. Oh, I said, rocking my chair back against the wall. I sat there perched on two rear legs of the chair. Mike did the same thing. Suddenly, Mike's dad burst through the rickety screen door and onto the porch. Mike and I jumped to our feet, not out of respect, but because we were startled. Ready, boys? Mike's dad asked as he pulled up a chair to sit down with us. We nodded our heads as we pulled our chairs away from the wall to sit in front of him. He was a big man, about six feet tall and 200 pounds. Mike says that you want to learn how to make money. Is that correct, Robert? I nodded my head quickly, but with a little intimidation. He had a lot of power behind his words and smile. Okay, here's my offer. I'll teach you, but I won't do it classroom style. You work for me, and I'll teach you. You don't work for me, I don't teach you. I can teach you faster if you work, and I'm wasting my time if you just want to sit and listen like you do in school. That's my offer. Take it or leave it. Um, may I ask a question first, I asked. Nope, take it or leave it. I've got too much work to do to waste my time. If you can't make up your mind decisively, then you'll never learn to make money anyway. Take it, I said. Take it, said Mike. Good, said Mike's dad. Mrs. Martin will be by in ten minutes. After I'm through with her, you ride with her to my super rent, and you can begin working. I'll pay you ten cents an hour, and you will work for three hours every Saturday. But I have a softball game today, I said. Mike's dad lowered his voice to a stern tone. Take it or leave it, he said. I'll take it, I replied, choosing to work and learn instead of playing softball. By 9 a.m. on a beautiful Saturday morning, Mike and I were working for Mrs. Martin. She was a kind and patient woman. She always said that Mike and I reminded her of her two sons who were grown and gone. Although kind, she believed in hard work, and she kept us working. She was a taskmaster. We spent three hours taking canned goods off the shelves, and with a feather duster, brushing each can to get the dust off, and then restacking them neatly. It was excruciatingly boring work. For three weeks, Mike and I reported to Mrs. Martin and worked our three hours. By noon, our work was over, and she dropped three little dimes in each of our hands. Now, even at the age of nine in the mid-fifties, thirty cents was not too exciting. Comic books cost ten cents back then, so I usually spent my money on comic books and went home. By Wednesday of the fourth week, I was ready to quit. I had agreed to work only because I wanted to learn to make money from Mike's dad. And now I was a slave for ten cents an hour. On top of that, I had not seen Mike's dad since that first Saturday. I'm quitting, I told Mike at lunchtime. The school lunch was miserable. School was boring, and now I didn't even have my Saturdays to look forward to. But it was the thirty cents that really got to me. Mike smiled. Dad said this would happen. He said to meet with him when you were ready to quit. What? I said indignantly. He's been waiting for me to get fed up? Sort of, Mike said. That's kind of different. He teaches differently from your dad. Your mom and dad lecture a lot. My dad is quiet and a man of few words. You just wait till this Saturday. I'll tell him you're ready. You mean I've been set up? No, not really, but maybe. Dad will explain on Saturday. I was ready to face him, and I was prepared. Even my real dad was angry with him. My real dad, the one I call the poor one, 
thought that my rich dad was violating child labor laws and should be investigated. My educated dad told me to demand what I deserve, at least 25 cents an hour. My poor dad told me that if I didn't get a raise, I was to quit immediately. At 8 o'clock Saturday morning, I was going through the same rickety door of Mike's house. Take a seat and wait in line, Mike's dad said as I entered. He turned and disappeared into his little office next to a bedroom. I looked around the room and didn't see Mike anywhere. Feeling awkward, I cautiously sat down next to the same two women who were there four weeks earlier. They smiled and slid across the couch to make room for me. Forty-five minutes went by and I was steaming. The two women had met with him and left thirty minutes earlier. An older gentleman was in there for twenty minutes and was also gone. The house was empty, and I sat out in his musty, dark living room on a beautiful, sunny Hawaiian day, waiting to talk to a cheapskate who exploited children. I could hear him rustling around in the office, talking on the phone and ignoring me. I was now ready to walk out, but for some reason I stayed. Finally, fifteen minutes later, at exactly nine o'clock, Rich Dad walked out of his office, said nothing, and signaled with his hand for me to enter his dingy office. I understand you want to raise or you're going to quit, Rich Dad said as he swiveled in his office chair. Well, you're not keeping your end of the bargain, I blurted out nearly in tears. It was really frightening for a nine-year-old boy to confront a grown-up. You said that you'd teach me if I worked for you. Well, I've worked for you. I've worked hard. I've given up my baseball games to work for you, and, and you don't keep your word. You haven't taught me anything. You're, you're a crook like everyone in town thinks you are. You're greedy. You want all the money and don't take care of your employees. You make me wait and don't show me any respect. I'm only a little boy, and I deserve to be treated better. Rich Dad rocked back in a swivel chair, hands up to his chin, somewhat staring at me. Not bad, he said. In less than a month, you sound like most of my employees. What? I asked. Not understanding what he was saying, I continued with my grievance. I thought you were going to keep up your end of the bargain and teach me. Instead, you want to torture me. That's cruel. That's really cruel. I am teaching you, Rich Dad said quietly. What have you taught me? Nothing, I said angrily. You haven't even talked to me once since I agreed to work for Peanuts. Ten cents an hour, huh? I should notify the government about you. We have child labor laws, you know. My dad works for the government, you know. Wow, said Rich Dad. Now you sound like most of the people who used to work for me. People I've either fired or they've quit. So what do you have to say, I demanded, feeling pretty brave for a little kid. How do you know that I've not taught you anything, asked Rich Dad calmly. Well, you've never talked to me. I've worked for three weeks, and you've not taught me anything, I said with a pout. Does teaching mean talking or a lecture, Rich Dad asked. Well, yes, I replied. That's how they teach you in school, he said, smiling. But that is not how life teaches you. And I would say that life is the best teacher of all. Most of the time, life does not talk to you, just sort of pushes you around. Each push is life saying, wake up. There's something I want you to learn. I had no idea what he was talking about. Life pushes all of us around. Some give up, others fight. A few learn the lesson and move on. They welcome life pushing them around. To these few people, it means they need and want to learn something. They learn and move on. Most quit, and a few like you fight. Rich Dad stood and shut the creaky old wooden window that needed repair. If you learn this lesson, you will grow into a wise, wealthy, and happy young man. If you don't, you will spend your life blaming a job, low pay, or your boss for your problem. You'll live life hoping for that big break that'll solve all your money problems. Rich Dad looked over to me to see if I was still listening. His eyes met mine. We stared at each other, streams of communication going between us through our eyes. Finally, I pulled away once I had absorbed his last message. I knew he was right. I was blaming him, and I did ask to learn. I was fighting. Rich Dad continued, Or if you're the kind of person who has no guts... You just give up every time life pushes you. If you're that kind of person, you'll live all your life playing it safe, doing the right things, saving yourself for some event that never happens. Then you die a boring old man. You'll have lots of friends who'll really like you 
because you were such a nice, hard-working guy. You spent a life playing it safe, doing the right things. But the truth is, you let life push you into submission. Deep down, you were terrified of taking risks. You really wanted to win, but the fear of losing was greater than the excitement of winning. Deep inside, you and only you will know that you didn't go for it. You chose to play it safe. Our eyes met again. For ten seconds we looked at each other, only pulling away once the message was received.